You already know Kowloon Restaurant, established in 1950 and spanning four generations, serves a multi-Asian menu. Did you also know that Kowloon Restaurant is New England's premier Asian dining and entertainment complex, serving Cantonese, Szechuan, Thai, and Polynesian cuisine? And did you know that Kowloon Restaurant is also the home of the finest Japanese sushi? If you haven't dined at Kowloon Restaurant lately, then you simply haven't dined at Kowloon. Kowloon Restaurant, Route 1 North in Saugus. This is Shelton Re Benjamin. This is Harley Race. This is Mick Foley. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster of Business. This is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. My name is Patrick Clark. I'm 19 years old and I was raised in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. When I was just two years old, my father was killed. And I knew at that exact moment that if I followed in his footsteps, I could end up just like him. Dead. The WWE saved my life by giving me the outlet that I needed to see that there's more to life than just a nine to five and that I could become bigger than my situation. For what time I have left, I want to live in my own house, sleep in my own bed. I don't want to deal in drugs, lose my ambition, and wind up dead. And that's how you remember me. That's the sad part. This ring, this is my realm. I dictate my future, I set the example, and I change the mold. I get to live, live without the fear of death. And it starts here. I am tough enough. Wrestling fans, welcome back to another special installment of Wrestling Insiders. Studio shoot interview with a young, hungry, young athlete that I have a heck of a lot of respect for, Mr. Patrick Clark. He is probably best known from his experience on WWE Tough Enough 2015. Yes. I don't know if you label those with seasons because there's mm -hmm. been you know, years in between mm -hmm. some of them, but he's a man that made an impression on the USA Network every Tuesday night. Yep. I'm still very confused as someone that's been around wrestling as long as I have, is why they didn't want you compared to some of the others that are still there. Where again, footage can be manipulated very easy, but yeah. Mr. Clark, I want to hear your story, kid. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me why your story, your video that you made, it was a great video that I think your partner put together. Thank you. You owe him a dinner. Tell me, kid. Why do you think you're not going to be in Winter Park, Florida, 20 hour, 24 hours from now, from when we're taping this? The WWE Universe is not ready for Patrick Clark. I'm it's ready. It's plain and simple. Well, you may be ready, but they're not ready. They, they want someone that doesn't look like a million bucks. They want someone that can't speak the best. They want someone like them. They want someone relatable. And it's unfortunate, but that's what they're going to get. I tell you, you look at both of the males, and you got ZZ. I mean, what are you going to do with ZZ? Hey, I mean, money to again, be made. this is not attacking him as a human being. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about what value these people would have to a professional wrestling slash sports entertainment product. Mm -hmm. I don't think he has any value. I mean, if you brought him in fresh, this is maybe a jabron you could put with the Wyatts. Maybe he could carry out the oh, no. no, for Bray Wyatt. I'm saying if he won, wins tomorrow. Well, night. the Wyatts can actually work. I'm saying if he's his job was to carry out the lantern. And that's it? <laughs> that's it. Well, maybe. I, I think mean, he could be great. ZZ is. He could be someone the Wyatts find in the bushes. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. He could carry out yeah. his alligator in the lantern. Exactly. <laughs> that's all he needs. He's a gator wrestler. ZZ's an entertainer. And he entertains very well in the sport of professional wrestler. So I guess he's a sports entertainer in that aspect. But. He's not a wrestler. No. But it's not about wrestling anymore. No. It's not about being a technical Sadly. wrestler. It's all about entertaining the people and, you know, giving them their money's worth. And if they feel like they can have a good time watching ZZ, then they're going to spend their money, and then there's money to be made with that character in Zamorai Loop. But Is that his name? Yes. Yeah, Zamorai Zane Loop. That's where ZZ comes from, Zamorai Zane. Yeah. You know what? Like I said, he might be a fine human being. I don't know what he offers WWE right now. I mean, is the USA Network drawing any more ratings because he's there? Comedy. No, 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 no. I mean, you can say that for a reality TV show, but at mm -hmm. the end, well, let me ask you this. You may know better than I do. Mm -hmm. Who's going to sign the check for the 250 k Is it USA Network or WWE? 
I would assume WWE because it's for the WWE contract developmental deal, but if they feel like they can make money with someone, they're going to make money they're with that go. person. Vince McMahon has been famous for years with making, Absolutely. making guys superstars. Even if you felt like they weren't superstars, he made them superstars. And I, I have all faith in the world that ZZ can be a superstar one day. Right now, he is not ready. No. And if you're going to no. put someone as the no. face of your competition for the next big thing, I don't think ZZ's ready. Let me ask you this. You look at Josh. This is a guy yeah. that's got the million-dollar look. Oh, he's yeah. got the Kevin Nash hair from the NWO the days. Bun. Young. He's got the football experience. Yeah. I tell you this. If I'm WWE, I'd say, you know what? No matter what happens in this show, this is a guy we're going to sign to the 50 grand developmental deal as soon as the show's over. Let's groom him fresh before he has a chance to touch the quote-unquote independents, yeah. which in some cases they look at as dirty. Fine. I mean, I invest money in Josh. I really, Mata was another one that I said, you know what? Yeah. Make some money with the guy. You know what? At the end of the day, you're the one that's ready. And I'm very angry about that. You are the guy that could deliver the goods right now. You're 19 years old. You haven't trained long enough. We've learned too many. How am I going to word this respectfully? We haven't learned too many traits that WWE may not like and yeah. one of their superstars. I would groom you to the hill. I'd give you that contract. Because none of the other people, on, as far as the males go in the tough enough division, you were the guy. How, I think we spoke about it earlier, but how did you, I don't think you gave me an answer. How did you feel when you were up to, who, was it Paige that picked Paige, you up? Paige, yes. When you were drawn up with ZZ, <laughs> who is ZZ, yeah. and Josh, who was a guy that could make money for the company, yeah. but had no ability and real no charisma and not much of anything other than going, so, I'm confident in the fact that I will be signed one day. Like you said, I'm young, I'm moldable, and as history has shown, you don't have to win tough enough to be a great. No. Every great superstar in the WWE, they never won tough enough. Everyone who has won tough enough, with all due respect to them, they kind of haven't done too much. You don't have any world champions with an exception no. of The Miz. And you have Ryback who's well on his way as far as the to goes, being no. a yeah. world champion. And The Miz was a runner-up. Ryback didn't win it either. So you don't have to win to be the greatest. History has shown that the greatest ones of Tough Enough have been runner-ups and they have been guys that did not win the competition. So I'm confident in the fact that I don't need the competition. I'm just a part of the WWE history at this point as far you as are, Tough really Enough are. goes. I'm going to have you sign the encyclopedia, kid, because I tell you what, you're going to earn your place in that book with a lot of the other people that are in there. I, I believe that, or I don't think Thank I have you. you here right now. And that's honest from the heart. I respect what you and your partner, Lai, have done a tremendous deal. Like I said in the beginning, I felt bad about how things worked out initially. I just wanted to give you guys the platform to get over what mm -hmm. the heck you could do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I don't think you got that on Tough Enough. It was just a... Uh, it was confusing to me. Even the voting, as far as... I, I would like to have been two people but yeah. people could say, I want to save this one, or I want this one eliminated, as opposed to the three, because I think it was three. I think you would have won, beat both. Well, I don't know about ZZ, but I definitely think you would have went over on Josh. And in the vote, weren't you last? I was you had last. To have been, I yeah. had to be last. How did you feel? What were your emotions? You had Renee Young running up to you with the microphone. Yeah. You know, Patrick, what would you think? And then you did the WWE Network exclusive. I didn't see that. I, I was, was just I was pissed as a person, never mind... Uh, a wrestling promoter or whatever it is I may be. How'd you feel, kid? I was happy with what I accomplished and I understood that it was a foot in the door. It wasn't the be all end all for me. I knew that this wasn't the end. I'm 19 years old, I have years ahead of me. I know that this was the opportunity that I had to show Triple H and Billy Gunn, Booker T. Lee and all the coaches and the host Chris Jericho that I am, I am something to look forward to in the WWE. I might not be ready right now, but I did show you what I'm capable of right now, and hopefully it was enough to bring me back in the future. The WWE Universe, they just didn't want me. And I can't argue with them. I don't believe them. that. But, I mean, none of those guys got it, wanted it, and would sacrifice for it. Because you get a lot of these losers that wind up in situations yeah. when they go and hire them off the street. If they don't have the passion, they don't have the desire, once they realize yeah. how much you have to put into a full-time deal with WWE, they, I don't want to say they're cowards, but they just don't have the desire to do it. You do. They could put you on the road this weekend 
and you'd fit because you want it. Well, I thank you for that. But in comparison to the other guys, like you said, I want it more. But like, like they brought it up in the mini camp. I mean, they use the age thing against me. I'm too young. I'm not right. They're looking for someone right now that they can brand. And I have a lot more room for improvement. I need to get bigger. You know, there's a maturity factor there with age. There's a lot more things I understand psychology-wise. And they're looking for someone that they can put out on TV right now that can make them money. They don't feel like that's me right now. The WWE Universe doesn't feel like that's me right now. Whatever they're their wrong. reasoning may be. They're wrong. I believe they're wrong, too, but how can you argue with the people that are paying their money? If it wasn't for them, how many we wouldn't people have are paying their money that watch Tough Enough? How many people are going out to WWE Live event to purchase a ticket? How many people watching for free on the USA Network and turn it into WWE Network subscribers? You know what I mean? Yeah. I think there's a lot of people that just wanted to tweet or whatever the process was mm -hmm. to vote for someone. And, I mean, ZZ was a disgrace. I mean, again, he may be a fine... I don't want to knock him as a human mm -hmm. being. He may be a fine human being. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean a fine human being is meant for wrestling. Like the guy in the top 40 with one leg. What was his name? Mike? Uh, Mike. Mm -hmm. He's, I mean, again... When you have a veteran that lost something in war, I mean, you can do nothing but honor that human being for sacrificing themselves for the United States of America. But that doesn't necessarily mean, because you have that empathy for the guy, that he's meant to be a superstar in professional wrestling. And if you look yeah. at that, I don't know if you'd call it a preview show, it, a lot of it was focused around him. Just because he has one leg, doesn't mean he's meant to be a WWE superstar. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm not meaning that as a knock against the human being. He's a great human being yeah. for giving of his life to go overseas to protect us, but that doesn't mean he should be, oh, we should bring him in just because people feel bad for him. Yeah. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. I mean, we're in 2015. The world has gone, has gone so soft. They feel like could be because you have a nice story. We need to invest in you. When the grit behind it all is, no, we're looking for the next thing. Because you've lost a leg. With all due respect to Mike, and I love Mike. You've got to give him all the credit in the world. He, he busted his butt doing that minicamp. He had balls to do yeah. what you and I didn't do. He signed up for the military and went overseas to protect the United States yeah. of America. No matter what some people think about the state of the military right now, that guy mm -hmm. went over there and did it for us. So we can do our wrestling thing or whatever it is we do in life. But again, does that make him a, a sports entertainer slash no. pro wrestler? Yeah. He was a um, hell of a militant. He sure. was a hell of a defender of our nation. But as far as being a WWE superstar, it just wasn't in the cards for him. Same thing with ZZ. He's a hell of a he's your buddy. wrestler. He's my buddy. Good person. Because he's a good you person. But a good person doesn't cut it in the WWE. We're here to make superstars, not good friends, not chums, not pals, not buddies. You can leave that to your personal life, but when you walk from behind that curtain, and you're in the middle of that ring in front of thousands of people, you have to turn on a different side to you, you know? Uh, prime example, Sarah Lee struggled with it all competition. She's just this she sweet, nice girl. Everything. Well, she's still at the end, though. Hey, you know, imagine if she gets 250 grand. Oh, she will. I, I'm going to bite my tongue for a minute, folks. We need to take a brief time out. Yeah. I'm really enjoying this conversation. I hope yeah. you are, too, because I, I want to keep going. I'm loving it. We got a lot of Patrick Clark talk. This hey, is yeah. a guy that's going to make an impact and the, I guess you'd call it maybe the sequel of the next chapter of the Millennium Wrestling Federation, Mr. Patrick Clark. We're going to take a brief time out. When we come back, we're going to hear the rest of his story. Wrestling fans, welcome back to the special installment, Wrestling Insider Studio Shoot Interview Series. Again, the youngest superstar, and I'm going to call you a superstar, kid, because I know you're going to be one. Thanks, We're going sir. to put your graph in that book, maybe on the back page, because, you know, you may break a leg and never make it. But you know what? We're yeah. going to think positive. I believe in you. Yeah. Nonetheless, 19 years old, Washington, D.C., tell me the story of Patrick Clark. We saw a little bit of it in that video, great video that was made. Yeah. Tell me your story, kid. So when I was two years old, my father was killed. Yeah, what uh, happened to the guy? He, he was stabbed. He was involved oh, in geez. some, he, he dabbled in the thug life, if you will. Yep. And, you know, that never turns out good. And unfortunately, 
you know, that put me in a position to grow up without having a father in my life. So my mother raised me along that's with my great grandmother. Right. Yeah, but I can empathize. I, I know my situation with the, the little Marathis. It's been a mm -hmm. tough one, but I, at least someone that's been to the dance. If we even if we didn't dance together, you know what I mean? Yeah, I feel like God made it work out for the best, though. He put me in a situation where. My mother and my great grandmother raised me majority of my Your life. Great grandmother. Now, how old yeah. was she raising you as a baby? Well, she she's about eighty something still now. Still alive about, now? Yeah. God bless yeah. the woman. Living in D.C. still, Good. and she likes to keep moving. So, they had a lot to do in me being the person that I am today. So, thank God for that because they raised me, and at the age of eight, I started to figure out that my father wasn't in my life. My mother was um, dating at the time. And she had remarried, actually, to my stepfather. And, that and I'd go for you. Well, when I was eight, I kind of had a crisis where I didn't realize that he wasn't my biological father. And my mother broke the news to me. You thought he was? Me. Yeah, I did. I okay. thought he was. And my mother broke the news to me. And I kind of freaked out. So as a coping mechanism, I just went to television. I was looking at cartoons, Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, all those things. And I couldn't find substance in those things that I was watching. So one day I'm flicking channels and I come to this, this channel where there's this, this square and it's got ropes around it. And there's this bald guy in a yellow mustard colored um, sports coat. And he's sitting in the middle of the ring in a wheelchair. And all of a sudden the screen goes black. And the lights come back on the TV and there's this figure in all black, black trench coat, black leather pants, black hat, black boots. And I'm amazed. It's like magic to me. And come to find out it's The Undertaker confronting Kurt Angle in the middle of a wrestling ring. And he picks him up out of that wheelchair and he tombstone power drives him. And the lights go back off and he's gone. And to me, that was the most amazing thing in the world. And at that point in time, I realized that this is what I want to be a part of. Just these two guys in the middle of this square with ropes around it. And you've got hundreds and thousands of people just watching it go on. No Millions. one's interfering. People are like into it and they're cheering what's going on. And I realized at that moment that this is what I want to do. I realized what- At that young age? Yeah. I realized which side of the barricade I wanted to be on. And I wanted to be the undertaker. I wanted to be in that ring and I wanted to be doing that type of thing to different people. And that's where it started. I started following the product. I remember it specifically. I've tried to become such a student of the game that I've learned a lot since then. And I'm just 19, so over 11 years, I've tried to learn as much as I can. And I remember going to a Toys R Us, and my mother would start buying me wrestling toys to help me cope with my father's yep. loss. And I remember specifically, there was an Elimination Chamber wrestling set. And the two characters that came with it was Triple H and Shawn Michaels. And I didn't know who they were at the time because I was a SmackDown guy. Oh, okay. And I said, no, I don't know who they are. I don't want that. They're probably bad wrestlers. And I would always go for the Undertakers and the Kurt Angles, Batista, JBL, Eddie Guerrero, all those guys who were on SmackDown at the time. And those were the guys that I looked up to. I looked at them as father figures in my life because... Yeah, yeah. I didn't really have one who was with me that I could connect to. And I really started falling in love with professional wrestling. I looked at that to save me, to keep me out of the bad and the negative that was surrounding me. I mean, I'm growing up in Northeast DC. It's not the, it's not the nicest place. You've still got drugs and violence going on. And it's not a place for a young eight-year-old to be and to find role models in. So I looked for that in the WWE, and I developed a personality um, like a pro wrestler. I looked to them for guidance, and I looked at them for how they reacted to certain situations. And it may not have been the best thing for me to do at eight years old because it's pro wrestling. It's the mm. wildest thing that you'll ever get into. But they did help mold me to become the person that I am and have the passion and drive that I have for the WWE. And that's pretty much my story, and here I am at 19 years old pursuing my dreams as a professional Seen wrestler. By millions each and every week on TV. Yes. Blessed. And now on the night before, you mm -hmm. should be the man collecting that $250,000 check. I should be. But if wishes were fishes, the world would be an ocean, wouldn't it? Do you think 
the WWE helped move you maybe in a positive direction following the quote-unquote baby faces of the time when you were a kid. Where do you think maybe you would have wound up if you eliminated professional wrestling, WWE, sports entertainment from your life? Well, not to speak bad on my family, but I have, I have an older brother. He's 26, turning 27, and he's not living the best life. He's got like three kids, about three different no. baby mamas, and he's... He's drinking, he's doing whatever he wants to do. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing, but that's where I would be right now if, if it wasn't for professional You're wrestling. Certain. Yeah. I, I would have followed the footsteps of the next male role model in my life, and that's my older brother. And I'm glad that that's not where I went. It's a, you know, I, I don't want, certainly don't want to knock your brother, but that's a difficult circumstance to be in and for a guy that's so young that well, you you know, don't 26 have to years old, it. you're still living life. You know what I mean? He yeah, made very poor kids. decisions. I won't sugarcoat it. I'll tell him to his face. My brother, he made very poor decisions for his life, but it's not his fault. That's how he was raised, and I sure. chose to be better than my brother. I chose not to be raised that way. I chose to do things differently and to find more success through the things that I was doing, and I did that with the help of the WWE. A lot of people may think that I'm kissing butt um, of the WWE when I say this, but Vince McMahon has been my biggest role model. And just... I got the I, I collect DVDs, wrestling DVDs, WWE we mainly. We got something for you, brother. And I, I collected the Mr. McMahon DVD. It's like half of Vince McMahon's face with half of Mr. McMahon's face. And I studied that DVD. And Vince McMahon is a man where he reaches for that brass ring and he takes it every time. He he doesn't pull punches. He knows what he wants. And as he says, he takes his competition by the throat and he squeezes the life out of his competition. He knows what he wants and he takes it. That's business, you know? And no that's how I've always wrestling been. Wrestling or, you know, I used to be, how can I swear this, a commercial account executive for the mm -hmm. biggest cable provider in the country. Mm -hmm. It's business, you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's what I've molded myself after. I've looked at things that I want in life and I've just taken them. There's no time to sugarcoat and to beat around the bush and to, you know, try to play you your way into things. You have to be confused with Fluff's bush, but mm -hmm. anyway. Probably died back there by now. <laughs> but, yeah, I just, I've molded myself after Vince McMahon, and I know that if I want something, I have to go out there and get it. You can't wait. You have to he go can't. out there and tell people what you want, and either they're going to respect you for it, or they're going to say get lost. And if they say get lost, it's going to be at their own expense because I'm going to come back better than ever, and I'm going to take it anyway. And they're going to be sitting in the dust wondering what they did wrong while I'm at the top of my game. So... Vince McMahon was a big, a big role model as far as my life He should be for concerned. just about everybody. Yeah. Because if it wasn't for him, whether you like the quote-unquote WWE sports entertainment model of today or not, mm -hmm. it's what it is, and that's what's providing more people than any other organization in the world with full-time jobs. Yeah. And you, if you can't respect the man for that, yeah. take a hike. He's creating more jobs than Obama is. I can tell you that much. You're not an Obama fan. No, not really. I'm not going to lie to you. George Bush, the second one, the, the junior, he is my favorite president in the world. And I, I'm not a Republican. I don't really classify myself as anything. George Bush was the most entertaining president that I've ever seen. I what, loved him. What was so entertaining about Bush? Not Everything that he did. Not where can you get a president where he's getting shoes thrown at him? He, he goes on live television <laughs> and he says... This thing. It's not a good thing, but it's entertainment. Yeah, why not marry into the family? There's money to be made. It's all about money, right? Business. Imagine how over indie wrestling would become. That's some heat right there. That'd be over. Oh, yeah, heat. Good God almighty. That's some Freddie Blassie heat right there. Uh, hey, Freddie Blassie, nothing wrong with him. One of the greatest not superstars, all. not only in America, but in Japan. The money that guy made. Oh, yeah. I don't know how many people it was that had a, a heart attack or a stroke mm -hmm. from him messing around with his teeth in Japan. There's Lassie a lot of Pencil Lassie. Neck geeks out there. People remember more along his promos, the My Breakfast with Lassie video that he did with uh, Mandy Gothman. Mm -hmm. But that guy was a household name in Japan. Oh, yeah. That he never reached in the United States. So let me ask you this now. You've become mm -hmm. a great wrestling fan, Undertaker, and the great faces of WWE yeah. have really inspired you. I mean, you know what? Believe me, kid, I feel for you. I, I don't want to say I know what's in your heart, but I understand the circumstances, if nothing else. What brought you to the point where you wanted to watch wrestling on TV to actually get to the point where you wanted to engage in the king of sports by training for it? 
I don't know, it's just, it's that something inside of you where you just feel like this is where you want to go. This is what you were made for. I never, I never looked at football or baseball, basketball the same way as I did professional wrestling. This was just it. You have these larger than life personalities that are just free of judgment, which exactly. is ironic yeah. because people are judging WWE superstars all the time, but who cares? I mean, you're a wrestler, you can do whatever you want and it'd be okay. You, know, you have justification for it. And then you have such a large following because there's so many people out there like those professional wrestlers that are just weird, crazy, out there, larger than life, and they need that one person to live through. Why not that be me? Why not have people live through me? Let me ask you this. I, we have a great interview coming up in the month mm -hmm. of October with your partner in crime, Mr. Rush. Uh -huh. He talked about a situation where you chased down his dad yeah. who was giving a speech. Tell me about this and what led that to you finally getting into the door to be trained as a professional. Well, I graduated from Forestville Military Academy really? in Forestville, Maryland. That's why you're such a respectful guy. Well, I try to be. I don't know if it was all Forestville. Maybe mom and, and grandma, but, you know, Forestville. Give them a shout out. They told me, yeah, mom, grandma, I love you. Forestville Military Academy, thanks for all that you've done. I graduated 2013 and I attended Bowie State University, which is the worst university you can attend. Uh, that's my little shout out to them. Don't go to Bowie State University. But I decided to study sport management. And in doing so, I was in my sport management 210 class, I believe. And we had a speaker for the day. That speaker's name was Lionel Green Sr. And he was looking for internships for his WBGR Sports Network. Oh, we got some plugs in for that, brother. Oh, there we go. And <laughs> I said, I need an internship, so why not listen to this guy, listen to what he has to say. And he's plugging himself, and he's getting himself over getting with himself the classroom. Over, yeah. He <laughs> says that he's looking um, for <laughs> interns, and then he mentions that he has a son, Lionel Green Jr., who is from Prince George's County, Maryland. He's an Asian. Yes, and he, this Asian, this black Asian, this Blasian is looking for a career oh boy. Are in the Are we pushing WWE. the limits tonight? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who cares? Sue us. So he's looking for this career in the WWE. And I said, well, I might not be Asian, but I'm black. And I'm also oh, looking yeah. for a career in the WWE. So this may be a guy that I need to talk to. So he does his presentation and he leaves. We're in college, we don't have to raise our hands to leave. You just get up and do what you right. want. So I go and follow him out and I said, sir, I'm looking for a career in the WWE. I actually just started with the independent wrestling scene and I'd like to get to know more about your son. Not the internship, but your son because- <laughs> You give a rat's ass no, about the no, internship no. at that point. I'm looking you for a connection. And that's what you wanted. Exactly. So he says, sure, if you're in wrestling, my son's looking to get into it, referring to Lionel, or Leo Rush, if you will. And he says, here's my number, here's his number, text him, and uh, you know, you guys can go from there. So I'm driving at the time, and I text him, and he says, yeah, I'm trying to get into wrestling. I spoke to a guy named Nui Tofiga, who's a um, Maryland wrestling legend. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'd love to get to meet you, and hopefully we get to start this pro wrestling journey together. So I go to his house in uh, Atlanta, Maryland, and I pull up to the house, and Lionel just walks straight outside, hops right into my car, and he says, let's I go hop. to IHOP. I hop. Yeah, IHOP. <laughs> he said, let's go to IHOP. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, sure. So we drive three minutes away to the IHOP. And you don't we know sit him down. at this point. I don't know him. This stranger has hopped into my car. All I know is that he attended a Prince George's County school like I did. He attended Duval High School. I attended Forestville Military Academy. And Was he speaking English or Japanese to you? He's speaking English okay. at this point. Right. And he says that, uh, let's just go to IHOP. Let's talk. Let's get to know each other there. So we're talking. We're talking. And we're getting to know each other. We're getting to fill each other out. <laughs> well, we're figuring out our goals in professional wrestling. And we have very similar goals. We just want to be the very best uh, that no one ever was. And we just hit it off from there. I mean, the rest is history. <laughs> there wasn't anything else. Did. But I tell you this, and I don't want to get into religion or whatnot, mm -hmm. but I don't look at that as a coincidence. I look at that is the booking of the big man upstairs. I truly do. Divine and eventually. Because you guys, were with the background you guys had with yeah. the amateur wrestling, graduating around the same time, mm -hmm. doing amateur wrestling around the same time in the same area, I think it was meant to be that his dad 
was going to do that speech at your college or yeah. wherever you were at the time, mm -hmm. and that you got involved and met him because it's a perfect, perfect mix that you guys have together. Oh, yeah. I I think the world of him. I respect the way he approached me back around Christmas time, and I respect the hell out of you from what you've done. Thank you. Um, so tell me this: you wound up going to wrestling school together. He told me you were the first two attendees. Mm -hmm. Tell me the story about your journey into professional wrestling training. Hmm. Well. Was it what you expected? How about that? It wasn't exactly what I expected. Like we said earlier, 2015, the world has grown soft. Sure. We, had, we started June 3rd, 2014, which the world's still soft at this point. And it wasn't as gritty and as grimy as I thought it was. I thought it was going to be... You thought there'd be more grit and grime. I thought it was going to be the days of the Andersons, Ole and Arn Anderson. thought they were going to go for the break your leg. Oh, yeah. I thought they were going to torture us, but they didn't do that. We had the pleasure of being coached by Kent Brink, Pat Brink, who was a WWE on. developmental talent. He wrestled as Calvin Reigns and Caleb O'Neill in FCW, and he was signed twice by the WWE. So he was teaching us from Dr. Tom Pritchard's guidebook. Right. The same one Good that he field. taught those guys in FCW, he was giving it to us. So we had the, the blessing to be able to get taught the WWE style from day one. So, I mean, we were set from the get-go. I mean, there's just no better way to get taught than the WWE style. We're getting taught TV sure. style, yeah. how to sail yeah. towards yeah. a camera. Hard cam. Yeah, how to work the Don't hard cam. Don't even get cam. me going on that because the oh, yeah. guys that screw with the hard cam and looking in the opposite direction, I want to, I'm going to watch my, my tone. Well, you can't I, I just blame don't them. Like it. It's their go. teachers. It's who taught them. They can't be blamed for that. Uh, but we were fortunate, nonetheless, to get taught by Pat Brink. He had quality training. Yeah, R.J. Meyer, who's the bruiser in Maryland Wrestling, Dean Gutrich, we'll give him Dan a McDevitt, Keenan Creed. Those guys have taught us everything that we know, and we've just expounded off of that knowledge, and we've created our own personalities and gimmicks in the wrestling world, and we continue to learn. We, um, we travel to ROH frequently. Uh, El Leo Rush has done the tryout for ROH. I heard he did very well from others that were in it. I, did so I don't know if you were there, but I did not get a chance not. to go because I was at uh, Tough Enough at oh, the time. Oh, really? All right. yes. Well, you get an excuse then. Yeah, yeah. He was doing his thing, going to the top promotion of the Indies. I was down there with the WWE, the top promotion. Anywhere in the world. Yeah, as far as professional wrestling and sports entertainment is concerned. So we're both doing our things. We're excelling where we need to be. And this was a plan from day one. When we got to that IHOP, we both said this is what we want to do. We both want to make it to the WWE, but I've always been a guy that just wants to get to the WWE, and I want to create that legacy there. Leo has always been the type of person that he wants to get that Sami Zayn experience. He wants to go international and make a name for himself before he gets to the WWE. That's a great experience for oh, someone. Oh, yeah. If they, if they don't feel they're ready, if they mm -hmm. don't feel like WWE may want them right off the bat. Yeah. The most styles you can master the more skills even out of the ring that you have, mm -hmm. it provides value to the company that's going to sign you, whether it be WWE or anyone else. Oh, yeah. I completely agree with that. So Leo's doing the smart thing. He feels like whatever's working for him right now, he needs to pursue that. And that's in international wrestling. Leo has a huge future ahead of him as far as international wrestling's concerned, and there's a lot of big things that he has in the plans as far as October goes and, you know, so on and so forth. It's like on a forth. Major League Baseball team. He's got a big October ahead for himself. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Leo Rush. Can you share he, any of these secrets? Well, I can't right now. I don't even know if it's supposed to go out there right That's now. That's all right. He'd probably right. kill me right now. Uh, now he's know. back in Maryland, so we don't need to worry yeah, about him. Yeah, he's back in Maryland, so we don't need to worry him. But he is planning to go international. That's all I can say. Great. Good for him. Yeah. Because like I said, I have a lot of respect for him, Kudos. too. Kudos. Give him um, a Barry Horowitz pat on the back right there. We his, have um, Patrick Clark right now here in the Millennium Wrestling Federation. We have Patrick Clark in studio. He's trained. He's ready to rumble. We're going to take a brief timeout. We're going to find out what in the world Patrick Clark does with his knowledge, his experience in that training center, and how he's become the man that he is at 19 years old yeah. sitting with me today. We'll be back after this brief timeout.
Wrestling fans, we are back. We're having a great time here at MWF Studios, along with a guy that I have a lot of respect for, Patrick Clark, a guy that has done it on WWE Tough Enough on the USA Network, a guy that we're going to see a heck of a lot of here in the Millennium Wrestling Federation. We hope we can come to terms before our 14th anniversary extravaganza, Monday night, September the 28th. I think it's going to be great, kid. Yeah. How long did it take for you to train before you made it to the live events? I trained under Maryland Championship Wrestling for seven months. I made my debut October 3rd, 2014. That's it? Yes, I really? wrestled. Yeah, yeah. I wrestled right. a singles match against Kai Katana in Waldorf, Maryland. And after that, I took a break, didn't wrestle my next match. Why did you take a break? Well, because they felt like I needed more training. They okay. just wanted to see okay. where I was right there. So that was my professional debut. Mm -hmm. I didn't wrestle again until December 27, 2014, when it was myself and Leo Rush versus the Appalachian Outlaws and the Punk Rock All-Stars in a actually, triple threat I think tag. I've seen that match. Yes, it was our I I got graduation match. That was supposed to be our Kevin Nash show, but Kevin Nash was unable to show, so we ended up having Mick Foley, mm -hmm. WWE Hall of Famer, come in and do some autograph signings that show. After December 27th, we wrestled in February of 2015, and from there we've just been on a roll. We both went our separate ways recently, Leo Rush winning the Shamrock Memorial Cup of 2015. Oh yeah, very good for himself. And myself going along the WWE Tough sure. Enough and getting yep. a foot in the door. So now we're back together. The independent scenes are still as hot as they've always been. And well, I disagree with you on comeback. that as far as what? them being hot. I think wrestling has rebounded to a great mm -hmm. degree over the past maybe year, year and a half as far as the independents go. Yeah. Before that, they were dead. Well, dead. Yeah. Dead. Like Reno. Yeah. Talking dead. <laughs> dead. <laughs> I mean, Reno, you got a pulse, brother? That's a different story for a different check time. Check them, check them. Six beats a minute. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about the Tough Enough experience. You work in the Indies. Yeah. And you decide, let's make a promo tape for me, like Quincy yeah. did, to send in to WWE for the Tough Enough yeah. competition. Tell me your thought process when you were making that great video. Well, I made the video with my partner, Leo Rush, mm -hmm. and we both knew at the time that we, we needed to get to where we wanted to go, and that's the WWE. Sure. So when Hunter, Triple H, announced that WWE Tough Enough was making its return for a sixth season in 2015, we know we need to make videos. So we, we watched some of the videos that already came up, and you get, you get the skinny guys going, well, let me tell you this, brother, and this is who I am, and this is what I'm going to do, and look at these pipes. And it's like, no. No, 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 no. I've seen Hulk Hogan before. I've seen The Rock and Stone Cold. You need originality. You need something different. So I decided that I would do my video based off of my life story, and that's my father's passing and how the WWE became my passion through it being a, um, a life-saving outlet because the things that the video required was it had to be at the most 60 seconds, the video had to be shot horizontally. Mm -hmm. You had to express your passion for the WWE. Plain and simple. They didn't want the next WWE superstar because they want to create that themselves. Sure. They don't want you to come in thinking that you have this ultra ego in mind. So I decided that I would get over with my story. Shoot from the hip. Yeah. And by the grace of God, I received an email that said that I would be set up for a Skype interview. I Skyped with a USA Network executive. And from there, he told me that my video and my Skype interview would be compiled into a 60-second um, montage that would be sent to WWE executives. Mm -hmm. And if they liked it, it would be put in a favorites pal. And all the favorites would be sent down to Orlando, Florida, which were 40 men and women who were picked as favorites and chosen to be a part of the WWE mini camp for WWE Tough Enough. So I went down there to the mini camp, and I meet people from bodybuilders to fitness models, pro basketball players internationally and NBA. You have NFL players. Um, you have all types of these awesome individuals who have made choices in their lives to be great. And the thing that resonated to me was they have already made their first choice. WWE was not their first choice. I was the only one there that didn't have some spectacular accomplishment. I'm 19 years old. This is my first accomplishment. This is what I'm going after. Mm -hmm. When they were 19, they've accomplished bodybuilding, and NFL, gator wrestling, and all these other things, weightlifting and powerlifting. And you have me, who, who I don't have a story. I'm creating my story as we speak. Your life is your story. Yeah. And here we are at the WWE. And we, do, we did the mini camp for about two days. 
did all the tryout drills, to my knowledge, and they came to their final 13. They eliminated 10 people the first day and eliminated another 10 the second day, 10 to 15, and came down to their final 13. The final 13 consisted of myself, Joshua, Hank, Alex, Mata, a guy named Khalil, and Tanner. Khalil was unable to participate in the show because he had um, had some complications with one of the testing they did. So they brought in ZZ was, as an alternative. Was that the kind of guy that was kind of light skinned? Yeah. Okay. And he yeah, had, um, he had been an NFL player, I believe, played oh, really? for the Bears. And he was unable to do it. So ZZ was brought in as an alternative. Then out of the females, you had Amanda, Gigi, Daria, Sarah Lee, uh, I believe Diana? Gabby was an alternative Diana? and Diana. Diana and Gabby was an alternative. Uh, Gabby was an alternative for Ashley, who, because of heart complications, could not compete in the show. Why didn't they test for stuff like that before they get to the point where they got picked? Well, know? they did. Oh, they did? The test results got back late. So as they picked their final 13, then the test came back, and that's when they figured out that Khalil and Ashley were un uneligible, and they brought back Gabby and Zizi as replacements. <laughs> Diana ended up leaving within the season, and they brought Chelsea in as a replacement. So out of 13 original cast members, you had three extra people who were alternative. So you had 16 actual cast members of the show. And now we're down our final four, which is an alternate in ZZ, Josh, who was an original cast member, and then you have, or competitor, if you will, and then you have Sarah Lee and Amanda. Diana, she was a pretty looking girl. She yeah. won one of the competitions. I think it was the swimming one. Yes. Why did she feel like she was pushed out the door and ran off with her boyfriend? Did she feel like she was being bullied at the barracks? Or do you think she just didn't care enough about this industry to keep going? I feel like it was a little bit of both. She, was, she has a fiancé. I don't know if they've gotten married yet, but I know that their decision was as soon as the show ended, she was going to go get married or somewhere around this timeline. I think it was September, she said. I watched yeah. the, whole, the whole season last night. Oh, well, yeah, September. Be hip to the blade. Yeah. She chose to leave. And something happened with a bar that she runs back home. One of her security guards or one, one of her close friends, he ended up getting injured and he was paralyzed from the neck down. Oh, geez. That's and too bad. she decided, out of the goodness of her heart, to take care of him. So I could understand that. But I also believe that there was the TV part of her. TV didn't exactly present it like that. Yeah. But that's reality yeah. TV. But I also believe that she doesn't really have it in her heart to do this. So she made the best decision for Diana, and she decided to leave, and that's where Chelsea came in. Did Diana have any kind of passion for wrestling, or <laughs> no. do you think she was just there to try and get a spot on television? Just there to get a spot on television. First guy that was eliminated, I believe it was Alex. Hank. Oh, Hank I'm sorry, first, Hank was first the first episode. person. That's right. He kind of took it on the chin for everybody yeah. else. Do you think Hank kind of got stiff? Did he have any true passion for the business, or was it so long we don't need you? Nobody had any passion for the business when it came to me. You had the passion. I was the only one. I was the only one with passion for the business. So don't get me wrong. Hank came in knowing that he had to learn the business. It's okay if you don't have passion. You've got plenty of superstars that didn't have passion coming in, but they learned the business, and that's more power to them. Yeah. So you have the guys and girls on the show that are still learning the business and learning to have a passion for this. And Hank was one of those people. Just in the first week, he was eliminated, and he didn't have a chance to show that he was growing that passion for the business. He was someone that I saw nothing in, to be honest. I mean, maybe he got the shaft because he was mm -hmm. one out of that quote-unquote little clique mm -hmm. of the bigger guys. But, you know, what did, WWE, what did WWE lose off of that? I thought Alex, I believe he was part Russian. Yeah. I could, you know, in all honesty, I could have seen him someone once he was groomed as maybe even a one-off for one of the top baby faces yeah. on Raw. And then, you know, like, uh, what was that guy's name? Kozlov. You yeah. just move him down the roster or so. Were you surprised to see him toss so quick? No, no, no. no. no Alex was a second elimination. I loved your confrontation with him. Well, you yeah. told him. Like I said in the episode, Alex is an A1 idiot. Okay? <laughs> you, you come into any profession and you say that knowledge of that profession means absolutely nothing. That's disrespect. That's a slap in the face to me. And anyone who's come before Look at how Hulk Hogan me. reacted. Oh, yeah. He was pissed. 
Because you come in and you say, it doesn't mean anything. And I even used his own profession against him in bodybuilding. I said, you don't go to a bodybuilding expo and not know who Arnold Schwarzenegger, Franco Colombo, Lou Ferrigno. You come in not knowing who Ronnie Coleman and Jay Cutler are. Do you? And he said, no, you don't need to know him. He was so focused on proving me wrong that he didn't realize he was digging a hole for himself. And he was just getting deeper and deeper in that hole. And come that Tuesday night of the second week, he was gone. He screwed himself. No one screwed Alex. Alex screwed Alex. All right, Vince, calm down. It's Excuse not 1997 me. anymore. You're right, you're right, you're right. Nonetheless, who else did we have axed early on? Third week, I believe that elimination was, I know it was a female. I want to say Daria. Oh, you, yeah, had, you Daria. had some rough comments about it her. It was Daria. The fallen angel. You said she looked like she fell down a tree. She and fell I'll down you, a spastic tree and hit every branch I'm not going to say anything negative, but. Gabby was out. Gabby. Gabby Which was one out. Was Ga oh, she know, was a nasty one. I'll tell you, I loved how she shot when it was done. She didn't give a fuck. She wanted to. She well, that, appeared like she wanted to train to be a professional wrestler, as opposed to reality TV nonsense. You know the reality. Yeah, Tell us. That's not the only thing she didn't give a shit about. She didn't give a shit about being a female. Now, the way I was raised, she didn't care about being a female. Oh no no no. Did she have a little Bruce Jenner in her? Or? Oh no no no. no she um know. no. She left Caitlyn at home. But she <laughs> she definitely. I don't know what it is about her um husbands, and that's with an S because she's had plenty. But she, she just didn't care. She didn't want to portray herself as a female. When I, when I what was, did she want to portray herself as if she didn't want to be a female? Or whatever Gabby um, Castronelli or whatever her name is, is she, she was came she to the show. Huh? Was she illegal? Well, I don't know. You don't know. All right. I don't know. Do you have your suspicions? <laughs> I do have my theories from here and there. But Gabby, she, didn't care. she would fart around us. She would burp. She just didn't. Really? I remember we were sitting on the couch one night, and the couch set up. It was a couch right here, a couch right there, and this couch facing the TV. And we're watching TV one day, and Gabby says, I'll be right back. And in the middle of her getting up, she just lets one loose. It's and you wrong. hear, it's wrong. And everybody's like, just, we're looking at each other, and we're like, did she just. And she did, and she wouldn't say excuse me or anything. She just farted, she passed gas, she burped, she did whatever she wanted. I remember one time we were standing near the um, nightmare zone, that's what um, Mata, Josh, Hank, and Alex, and Tanner called their room, and... The nightmare squad? The nightmare zone. The Why was it the nightmare zone? Well, because people were getting eliminated left and right from there. Oh, okay. That's, that's the real reason, but she says to me, you don't mind if I fart, do you? And me trying to be a nice, professional young man, I said, no, it's your body, it's free air, do whatever you want. And that would give me enough time to walk away. So after I say that, she says, well, it's too late. It's already happened. You know, the it goose has been much, cooked. There was that much discussion about it. Oh, yeah. The TV's was, on. All right. You know? And she's watching it. She just, she let loose. She didn't care. She would fart and be as nasty and grotesque as she wanted to be. Like some of and the people okay at the studio, that. yeah. Oh, yeah. And that was Gabby for you. And she went home because if she didn't care, she would bring up the fact that Amanda had implants and things like that. But it's like, you have implants, too. And now she's at the Wild Samoan Training Academy trying really? to become a professional I wrestler. respect her. I do. As nasty and as trifling as Gabby wants to be. You made the comment when they did the dress-up, when you were the, uh, was it the evil? Evil intellect, the yes. Evil yes. intellect. There you go. I watched mm, that last yes. night. You said you wanted to plow the farmer's daughter. Did you ever plow the farmer's daughter? Oh, no. Now, Gabby would walk around the room as she pleased, tits out, ass out. She didn't. She had these little things. I don't know. You know how you go to sleep and you have the eye patch over your ass as you rest? She had the she had, a, I, she had an eye patch, but she also had the, um, I like to call them the Janet Jacksons. You know the Super Bowl, how she had those stars over herself? She had, like, little strips of tape. She had decorations for yeah, her nipples. Yeah, she had de decorations. Right, well. And she would put, like, little tape strips <laughs> over the nipple. Maybe she watched Fully Loaded 1998 with Rena Marrow and exactly. Jackie. Exactly. So you would know that, but the rest of the jabrons would not. Oh, they, they wouldn't. I remember the guys came up. They, they would answer their Twitter questions. And the thing that fans would ask is, what's your favorite match? And the guys didn't have a favorite match because they, they don't watch. And if they did watch, it hadn't been since they were kids. 
So they all came up with this one favorite match that they all had, mm -hmm. and it was Taker versus Austin versus Triple H and No Mercy. What year was that? I don't remember. I think it was 99 or happened. something. Taker was gone in the fall of 99 for No Mercy. He was well, injured. Well, they found a match of it, and I remember watching a shoot interview that Alex did with um, some guys that Who's I know. Alex? I don't know. Oh, the Russian guy from Tough Enough, you mean? Yeah, yeah the, See, um, okay, okay. he doesn't care about his history, so we don't care about him. So Drama. he brings that up, yeah. And he says that this is my favorite match. You got Marta and you got Tanner and them. They're like, okay, this is a favorite match if anybody asks. So Alex is doing a shoot interview, and this guy who knows his history is covering for Alex. And he's like, most people may think that he's speaking about the No Mercy match from 1999, but he's actually talking about the international match that happened this date and that date. It wasn't No Mercy. No. I know that is a fact. And Alex is sitting there like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I'm talking about. But it, it just goes to show that these guys were looking for fame, and they would say anything and everything they needed to say in order to get that fame, in order to stay around a little bit longer. And it was just pathetic. What about Mata? This is a guy that had a good size. He had mm -hmm. a great, unique type of look. Mm -hmm. When they did that stupid dress-up show, he actually came up with something pretty decent. Yeah. Did he have any interest or background in wrestling, or was he just no, made to think for the TV? I would say he did it for TV at first, but becoming close with Marty and knowing where he's going now, I believe he and Daria have actually signed up to Santino Bros in California. Really? Yes, and they are currently pursuing a professional wrestling dream. But they really didn't have anything else to do, to be honest. There you go. You know, Who else so why did you not? have on there that I thought had potential? The girls. Uh, Gigi. Chel Gigi. Yeah. Pretty girl. I mean, she had a nice Australian accent, Beautiful. which was different. Do you have any situation with Gigi? No, we did a hot tub scene, but... Now, let me ask you this. Was that, quote-unquote, produced, or was it natural? Because it seemed like there was a little working in the conversation there. I like to be was entertained. It, let me ask you this. Was it suggested by anyone for that segment to take place? No. I said... No. I thought what better way for the two winners to spend their night than in the hot tub speaking together. And the cameras picked up on it. They said, let's catch this. Now, I'm not a man that air my dirty laundry out in public. But so wait till I said, after the show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I said to Gigi, since the cameras are rolling, let's be entertaining with this. And she played along, and she treated me like, you know, good boy, good boy, you know. And I was just the horny little teenage guy, you know, that wanted some. But... Gigi's a really you sweet girl. You and ZZ girl. look, yeah, you look kind of odd sitting there all alone. ZZ's a, um, you ZZ's and your buddy a strange ZZ. bedfellow. That's a, um, that's a WWE reference to an old match. Is that what they said? Yeah. ZZ, he just, ZZ has grown up in Bayou Buff, Louisiana his entire life. This was a hell of an experience for his life. Oh, yeah. He just went to New York for the first time for SummerSlam a few days ago. And he was loving it. Other than New York, he's only been to Florida. These wow. are the only places he's ever been outside of Louisiana. Good for him. As a human being, good for him. Yeah. So as a wrestler, uh, anyway, we talked about that. As a wrestler, that, that's yeah. never going to happen. But you know, ZZ, like he said, he thought people got naked in the hot tub. He did what he saw in the movies. He doesn't know anything else. There's plenty of money to be made with Josh. He has that look. Um, seeing him next to Big Cass from you know Cass and Enzo, I. He's got the size of Big Cass. He's just a big guy. He has the work ethic, and he's used to traveling on the road with the NFL. He's used to being home for short periods of time and being right back on the road. He has a daughter, and he has a girlfriend, I believe, back at home, and they're ready to move. They're ready to uproot and move to Florida. Really? And to begin his Good career. Good if he really takes it that oh, yeah. seriously. Where is Patrick Clark going to be five years from now? I mean, I'd love to say it's here in the Millennium Wrestling Federation, but I know you're a shooting star, brother. Patrick Clark will be in the WWE. He will have signed a contract for many years. And if he hasn't already accomplished winning the WWE Championship, he'll be well on his way to winning the WWE Championship and making history as 24 the first years old. 24 years old, right. as the first ever African-American WWE champion. I will be the face of the WWE. I love it. I love your attitude. It's very positive, and there's a work ethic that goes along with it. You're not just some fool on Twitter no. saying this is what I want to do. You dedicate yourself. Mm -hmm. The night after you were eliminated from Tough Enough, what did you do? The night after I was eliminated from Tough Enough, 
Went to the hotel, got told when my flight would leave, which was the very next day, and I went straight to training. I respect you. I hope you know that. You Thank have a you. place here in this, whether it's you look at it as Boston Wrestling, the umbrella over the Millennium Wrestling Federation, or the MWF itself. Let me tell you this. What do you think you're going to bring for the fans once you compete in the squared circle for the Millennium Wrestling Federation? I want to bring to the fans of the WWE Universe the same thing that was brought to me. If they're spending their hard-earned money, I want to take them to a place where they don't have to worry about the woes of their everyday life, where they don't have to worry about bills that need to be paid or loved ones that are hurt or sick at the moment. Mm -hmm. I want to take them to a place where they don't have to think about the negatives of their life, where they can be consumed by the purity of sport entertainment and by the action and entertainment that I can bring to them in the middle of that squared circle in this giant arena. I want to take them away from that for moments that I'm given in front of them. And I want to make them kids again, you know? I want to take people out of that, that stress zone and bring them to a comfort zone where they don't care anymore. That's what I want to do for the WWE. If you talk to WWE since you got eliminated? I have not talked to the WWE, but I've definitely kept in contact with personnel in the WWE. Good. Very good. We talked about your great career. We're going to have more once we have a chance to sit down in studio again. Christmas is coming, yep. and we know how much we love holiday headlocks here in the Millennium Wrestling Federation. Some of your friends were even the host of the celebration we had a couple of years back. But I can't tell you, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to do in the MWF. And even more so, I'm looking forward to what you can do in the king of sports professional wrestling as your life goes on. I believe in you. Thank you, Dan. Very happy to have you here, brother. You give me a handshake. Thank you for Part having of me. the family, brother. I'm Dan Moratti for this guy. You're going to watch him. You're going to wish you were here in studio. You don't need roller skates for him. Patrick Clark fans. We'll see you next time. You and yours, stay well. Heart. Passion, desire. Patrick Clark showed his this summer on the USA Network and continues to do so this very minute as he dedicates himself to a full time career in the king of sports professional wrestling. Where tough enough contract winners Josh and Sarah Lee go in WWE is anyone's guess. Everyone in the Millennium Wrestling Federation looks forward to his in ring debut this fall, as well as returning to the studio to field fan questions we didn't have time for tonight. Visit the BostonWrestling.com super site. For news on our 14th anniversary special, September the 28th, along with our upcoming live events and studio shoot interview productions. Continue to follow Patrick on his journey here in the MWF, as well as on his social media platforms.